everybody. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Sisters podcast, where we give you our point of view. We are proud members of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network, and we are so excited to be here with you today. I am Tamia Harper, your host, and I'm joined by my sisters, Sabrina Wood, whoop, whoop. Yvette Blackman Tom, hello, and Fran T. What's happening? <laughs> and okay so it's been a long time since we've all been together um uh, i've missed you all and i'm great i'm so excited to be coming back for this particular show because today we have true star trek royalty in the house with us and we sisters could not be more pleased or more tickled or more ecstatic and honestly really humbled and very honored to have this guest with us. I am going to let my sister Sabrina do all the honors for this part. So the surprise guest that we have today is Miss Adele Simmons. Thank you so much for being here, Miss Simmons. And if you don't know this Woo-hoo! name, Woo-hoo! yay! <laughs> Adele Simmons is actually one of those hidden figure sisters. She is the one who was the assistant director for every single year of Star Trek Next Generation and several of the years of Star Trek Voyager. Now, if you don't know what that means to be an assistant director, we're going to break it down for you. Yes, we are. But mm-hmm. basically, it is the make it so person. <laughs> so we're going to go through, and Miss Simmons is going to tell us all about this wonderful career she had. I mean, how she got into this and why we didn't know her until just a little while ago. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so Miss Simmons, thank you for coming and tell us, I mean, how did all this happen? Well, uh... <laughs> That's a real good question. I asked myself. <laughs> I was very, very fortunate, and I worked my butt off. So I know. it it's just like Oprah has told us: you got to work twice as hard and be twice mm-hmm. as good as the competition. Yeah. And that's that's really what it took. But to get into it, I was. Um, I was in junior college and ready to transfer to a four-year college and trying to figure out what I wanted to major in and ran into an old friend who said, well, I'm going to major in TV. And I thought, oh, that, that sounds like fun. I thought it would be sitting around watching television. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I did. That's how naive I was. And so I majored in uh, TV and film production And once I got my degree, I tried out for the assistant director training program, uh, which is the apprenticeship to the Directors Guild of America. And I was very fortunate to be uh, the, 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 the program tests about a thousand people a year. They come from all over the world, really. Wow. And then they... Uh, they test you and then they interview the top 100 scores. And of the top 100 scores that year, they took on 10. And oh so I was one of the 10. Oh my, wow. Uh, so you were, you were that, literally the talented 10th. I was, I was, I was part of that 1% that made it that year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And if you don't know, th- this is a really, I mean, obviously this is a really incredible program, but the Directors Guild of America is the program. So this is a program that everyone is trying to get into, as Ms. Simmons just said, and it is world renowned. So coming out of this, you are automatically a second a second assistant director, and it is 400 days of torture from what I read. 400 days of, of torture, of 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. calls. Many a day I worked from, I had to show up at 3 a.m. to let the trucks into location, mm. open location for trucks, and then work until midnight. But you do it with a smile because you know what it's going to lead to. And mm-hmm. um, it's it's hard work, but, you know, hard work is is the fuel we run on. 
But now I think I read somewhere in your bio that not only did you do this with a smile, but you did this with a child in the I house. I did. I did do this with a child. Yes. Um, when I went in for my interview, um, which was 1985, uh, one of the first questions that I was asked it was all men, one woman, was, does your husband approve of you doing this? Wow. No, be they from didn't. Home. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, my husband, he's ready to retire. He he's ready for a working wife. <laughs> <laughs> but a little light bulb went off in my head that said, Don't tell them you've got a daughter. Ah, tell uh -huh. them that you're you, you know. And so I didn't. Mm -hmm. And years later, when these people were my peers. Uh, the one woman on the panel came back to me and said, you know, it's a good thing you didn't mention you had a child because you would not have gotten in. Wow. 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 So wow. I, I was the first female parent because I'm sure lots of fathers got mm -hmm. through the, got mm -hmm. into the, mm -hmm. sure. but I was mm -hmm. the first female parent admitted to the program. Wow. wow. And how old was your daughter at the time? She was five. Oh, and a the little mom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the fortunate thing is that uh, the second AD hires the extras. So whenever I had <laughs> children working on the show, I hired my daughter as one of the extras. <laughs> all right. There would be a school teacher there and, you know, all the, the, the legal requirements would be met to have children on stage. And she got to come and see what mom does and the cast just took her to heart i mean patrick stewart and marina they just spoiled her to death <laughs> and um she would often come visit the set in the evenings after school if i was working late mm -hmm. so she really felt a part of that group oh man that would have yeah. been all i needed to hear yeah mom's working on star trek yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was great it was great That's i'm gonna so be looking out for I'm going to be, this is Fran and Simmons. I'm going to be looking out for her in some episodes now. I should, I should write down the name of the episodes. Oh, um, gotta be, it's got to be the ones when they kidnapped all the children. She's got to be in that one. Yes. And they took them down to that oh! planet. <laughs> she, she's in a bunch of them. Okay. Oh my God. Now, okay. Now she is a, a well-adjusted adult, married, nice. <laughs> and works in post-production at Warner Brothers. Oh, that's oh, so cool. Oh, She's okay. followed in your footsteps. Oh yeah. All right. Oh yeah. Well, I, I have one other question. So this is my. <laughs> I, I went through your bio of all the other shows that you were working on, and all I have is a one quick non-Star Trek question. Uh -huh. So. I see that you were the AD on No Way Out with Kevin Costner. Yes, I was. Oh, my God. So I just <laughs> want to know, did anyone know at the time when they were making that film that this was going to be a, such a breakout film for him? Well, it actually wasn't. He had made uh, Silverado. Was it Sil he made Silverado, uh, Silverado mm -hmm. but then... Um, that was he had played the dead body in um whatever that first movie uh oh, yeah. that knocks really out hurt and everybody yeah yeah you know the one that one uh, yeah um, <laughs> can't think of it any with all the, nice all the music friends come did. back for exactly. the reunion yeah the, the um, good music and then he made Silverado and then he made No Way Out and based on the reaction to Silverado and the fact that he was immediately going from No Way Out to do, oh, wait a minute, I got to Google it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the big remake of... Um, the Untouchables? No. Untouchables, right. The Untouchables. Sorry. Yes. Oh, yeah. We knew that he had signed to do Untouchables, so the producers decided to hold No Way Out Oh. Until after he uh, did Untouchables, oh. and Untouchables was released, and then his then they released uh, No Way Out. Oh. So they just kind of uh, gave themselves a boost because they knew what a big hit Untouchables was going to be. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. That was it. That was my non Star Trek question because I saw Kevin Costner and I was like, oh my god, I got it. And he is just as nice as you want to think he is. Oh, he seems to be. That makes me happy to hear. He's Mm -hmm. just as cool and down to earth. And you know, a a number of nights we would sit on the floor, cross legged, eating Indian food, just chopping it up, talking. (laughs) It was great. It was wonderful. Oh my god. So, so I want to go back a little bit because I saw also in your bio that you had a free ride to law school. I did. <laughs> okay, so you finished film. You finished your uh, undergrad as a graduate in film and direct film and production. Right. Then you go to law school, right. and now it's the big the big choice, right? Right. Um, and I had the opportunity when I found out, you know, I took the DGA training test on a lark, never thought I was going to pass. It's just, you just go and you just automatically take that test, (laughs) but I'm, I'm good at test taking. Mm -hmm. And, um, I did well on that test. And then when I had a choice of solving other people's divorces and bankruptcies and, Mm. (laughs) or working in Hollywood, I picked, working in Hollywood. I would too. I don't blame you. (laughs) Yeah. I just just had to ask that question because it seemed like you just made a pivot. I did. I did. Um, I had always had in the back of my mind that law school could be an entree into um, uh, producing Um, And it's a wonderful education. I recommend law school for everybody because it just teaches you how to look at the world in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. So it it was, it was a benefit. It helped me in, uh, in my career, having that background, but um, film was what I wanted. I I came from a bit of a show business family. My grandparents were entrepreneurs in Los Angeles and my grandfather was the uh, doorman at the Macombo, which oh. was the premier uh, nightclub in Los Angeles at the time. And I remember um, he also ran the parking lot and my grandmother ran the indoor concessions. So they had the men's room, the women's room, the cigarette girl, the cloak room. Wow. Uh, the photographer. The, the franchise whole... right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they rented all those concessions from Charlie Morris, Morrison, the uh, owner of the Macombo. Oh, okay. So because of that, and because my grandfather was, you know, this big personality, he, you know, we, I grew up with Nat King Cole in and out of the house. Mm-hmm. We would spend the weekend with Cab Calloway and his family oh. in the 30s. And, you know, just this constant kind of um, influence when I was a, a very young girl in the 50s. Because everybody was coming to the Macombo. Everyone was coming to the Macombo. Everyone knew Ernie. Mm-hmm. No. Oh my God! I'm feeling the script coming out of this. this is- <laughs> <laughs> uh oh! Uh oh! <laughs> well, you know, this is the kind of thing. Like I've heard of the Macombo. You know, I'm a big classic Hollywood fan, and I- I've heard of the Macombo all my life. You mm-hmm. know, one of the things I'm going to do, you know, one day, is go wherever the Macombo used to be. But <laughs> right there on Sunset uh, Boulevard. Right, oh, but you wow. never heard that. You know, black people were running the concessions at the Macombo. Right. I never heard this. Right. But who else was? Right. My <laughs> my grandfather would come home with stories like uh, uh, had to turn Marilyn Monroe away. She couldn't. I couldn't oh. let her in because she showed up bare legged in Hirachis. Right. Exactly. Um, and and there there were nice country country. Uh, there were, <laughs> there were there were other stories like the night Frank Sinatra decided to put on a show for the boys, mm. meaning the boys mm-hmm. who ran the parking lot, the parking lot boys and the kitchen boys. Oh. And he stayed in the kitchen with them, putting on a concert just for them until the oh. sun came up. Wow. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
That doesn't surprise so, me. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but it's it's you know Sammy Davis, Lena Horne, they were all familiar faces in in the house when I was a kid. Oh, oh wow. my god! Yes. <laughs> I, I, you I were so deep. This is better than Star Trek. Trek. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a lot better than Star Trek. Right? Saying, sure right? those, are, those are my peoples. <laughs> That's it. Frank Sinatra oh, and oh come on. Imagine now. Sammy it. Davis and mm-hmm. Cab Calloway. Come on. Yeah. Oh. Le- Lena Horne. Yeah, Lena we Horn? all thought we all mm-hmm. thought that uh, my uncle Michael was gonna marry uh Cookie Cole. Oh uh oh was the oh. um the older Sister daughter of Natalie. The older yes, daughter. The older daughter. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Her name her real name was Carol, I think it was. We uh-huh. called her Cookie. Mm-hmm. You know, because we do, we would. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Man. I- I'm sitting here now trying to get you back to my Star Trek questions. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is like, fascinating. Whatever I ask now is just not going to be. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, oh so goodness. I have a, I kind of have a, 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 it makes me wonder though, when you, first um were accepted into um the program to go you know for the apprenticeship i mean were there other black and brown faces with you um there was no one else of color in my class um and there were many many days and nights uh for the entirety of my career when I would look around and I would see nobody of color around me except LeVar, you know, the actors, mm-hmm. LeVar mm-hmm. And, and Michael Dorn. Mm-hmm. But uh, the one thing that I think you have to realize is that because the film industry and the TV industry happened behind closed doors, mm-hmm. behind those vault-like security gates, it really is insular and it really can be substantially behind, socially behind the rest of society in terms of uh, race. Uh, I've already told you what they asked me, you know, does your husband mm-hmm. uh, approve? Yeah. Um, so that mentality ha- has been chipping away. They now have diversity officers in all of the uh, studios they're uh, very actively promoting diversity, but none of that was happening when I went through my um, original days. Mm-hmm. And Not it was all. tough. Mm-hmm. It was tough. I'm sure it the, was. The guys wow. with the big belt buckles, the Teamsters and mm. Grits, they didn't understand. First of all, they didn't understand a, a woman assistant director mm, running sure. things on the set and they really didn't understand and a black woman director mm, ooh, assistant director running things so what i learned is that they really they don't respect anything they don't care if you're tall you're smart who your daddy was they don't care about anything they want to know can you do the job can you mm. get them out of there on time they don't want to be there wasting time because um, you know everything has not all the I's were not dotted, the T's were right. not crossed, and so once you prove yourself, and they begin to trust you, and then they begin to know, okay, we're going to be fine because Adele has got this show. Uh-huh. Yeah. And right I picked now. up a couple of name nicknames. One was Adela the Hun. <laughs> <laughs> and the counter personality was Adela the Honey. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Hey, so, you got to do. Yeah. You Depends gotta, on you which way you were coming at us. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, because I was thinking about, you know, when it was reading the description of everything that an AD has to do, that, you know, it has to be a, a personality of uh, it doesn't take any mess, you know, right. like you got to run a tight ship, but you can run a tight ship like also with some honey too like you said (laughs) you know but I mean I was thinking like how formidable uh, of a woman you are to survive in that environment you know um, and thrive 
you know, not, and not just get crushed by the loneliness of it, or sometimes, like you said, the indifference, or sometimes the ignorance, or whatever else you might have had to face. Um, you know, it just speaks volumes to who you are. Well, uh, I, I have to say a great deal of uh, my personal success was due to uh, the cast of um, once I got to Next Generation and moved up to first assistant director where you really are running the show. Mm -hmm. um, I had the total support of Patrick Stewart, Whoopi Goldberg, um, Jonathan Frakes, Brent Spiner. They all let it be known that we like her. Mm. We like her a lot. And so the crew is going to pretty much follow the lead of the actors. And um, that was a, a great help, an enormous help. I owe those people a lot for their support mm -hmm. during uh, the Next Generation years. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and apparently they loved you because you actually had your name canonized into <laughs> the did. series. Yeah. Did you know that that was going to happen? No. <laughs> um, one of the things you have to do with the script, if there are any uh, line changes to the script, you've got to call up to the office so they can let the script editor know and, you know, it can get handled appropriately um, by the script department. So Patrick said to me, oh, Adele Darling. You haven't been called Darling. You've been called Darling by Patrick Stewart. Uh, <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> He said, call the office and I'm going to change this line here regarding my aunt Rebecca and her mm. tea recipes. But he didn't tell me what he was going to change it to. So I called it in. They said, okay, fine. And then when he delivered the line on camera, he changed it to his aunt Adele. Oh. <laughs> so I was, the, I was the most surprised person when I heard it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, he also, he's another one who is just as good as gold in real life. Oh, that's good to know. Oh, that, that is makes, good to hear, too. <laughs> yeah, that makes us very, very happy. <laughs> you, not all of them are. Right. Mm. Not, not, mm. I've, I've seen some things. Mm. Um, I'm sure. You know, I worked on Dynasty, and um, they were wonderful, <laughs> too. You should see the faces of the sisters. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dynasty. You I don't remember know. the episode with the fight scene between of course, and and we all yeah. Yeah. Yes, girl. That was for real. <laughs> oh, that oh, was God. absolutely for real. Those two women. I believe it. Yeah. Oh, uh, I believe that. Uh, no yeah. love lost there. You could tell. Yeah. Like, I, mean, tell I remember sitting. Each other. Because, you know, back in those days, we would have dinner and watch TV mm -hmm. like during dinner, right? And everybody always, it had to be like, was everybody was watching the same thing. We didn't mm -hmm. have multiple TVs and weren't eating yeah. in multiple rooms, you know? And or I so have multiple with, stations. Right. I have a, <laughs> so Dynasty ruled in our house because my mother was a huge Dynasty fan. I mean, we went from Dallas to Dynasty. And, <laughs> you know, and that fight scene, I remember, and my mother said, those women don't like each other. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get them out of their trailers was a feat because neither one of them wanted to come to the set before the other was on set. <laughs> so you would have to kind of massage that. But I'll tell you another one that's good as gold. And that was Joan Collins. She oh, championed really? me on that show. Uh huh. Wow. She made sure nobody messed with me, that, you know, nobody, you know, they would do dumb things like send you to find a left handed wrench there is no oh, god <laughs> no uh-huh stupid things mm -hmm. um she made sure that nobody messed with me mm -hmm. on on that show she was my champion on that show so oh, the, the I'm, star I'm trek connection grateful. that's why yeah. yeah that's right star yeah. trek connection star trek it all comes <laughs> back to star trek it yeah, always Joan comes Collins. back to star trek well, exactly yeah she got my vote that's a good that's a good person to have have your back because she oh, didn't yeah. take no mess like ever exactly <laughs> exactly she came in in the second season and just owned it mm -hmm. oh yep. i remember that when she came in oh my god i'm like oh that <laughs> show got best. good all of a sudden <laughs> 
Well, the <laughs> best you, you already knew who number character. one was on that show when she showed up. <laughs> I remember seeing her in a, a, a this is a total sidebar tangent in a in a in a Agatha Christie Miss Marple production from mm-hmm. the BBC back to I mean and I forget which I can't remember which Miss Marple it was, but I mean it was oh I mean maybe Joan Hutchinson. I mean this great classic British actress, right? And then here she comes. And she steals the whole show. It was like it was like I was watching a different Agatha Christie show. She's just amazing. I loved her. Okay, yeah, that's my sidebar. <laughs> I, I also wanted to mention you talked about she's canon as Aunt Adele. Oh, we we call you Auntie Adele. I just I let you know that. Okay. Um, so I also found out that you're also your name was actually in Voyager. You're actually one of the crew members. Uh, a uh, Lieutenant Adele G. Simmons is one of the crew members who actually survived seven years of the Delta Quadrant on on Voyager. I don't know if you knew that too. I'm sure you knew that, but no. I just want to make sure. Yes, <laughs> it's. In, <laughs> I just I found that out during I was looking at um looking at your bio and then going to Memory Alpha. Right. And there you are. There's your name, and you could see it. It's on the crew manifest on Voyager. I think in the caretaker. And the killing game, I think it was. Yeah, well, all of those acutograms and all those graphics that you see um, on the consoles were names taken from the crew list. So my name probably appears quite a few times um, (laughs) in in different acutograms and different graphics and um, different kinds of references. Right. I love that. That's that. good to know. I'm going to go look myself up in the. <laughs> yes, do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> okay. oh, all right. So that's going to lead me to my, my next question. I wanted to know. So we, we um, also uh, watched The Seventh Rule and we were watching Sirach Loft and, you know, kind of re reacquaint himself with his show that he started, and, you know, back in the day. He's watching it over again. So if we were going to sit here now and do Next Generation, would we have to do a rewatch with you? Or have we see, have you seen all these episodes after you slaved over them from three o'clock in the morning until you know midnight? Did you then go and watch these broadcasts when they no. came on? <laughs> <laughs> because the only time with those kind of hours, the only time you would be able to do that would be on the weekend. And on mm-hmm. the weekend, I'm busy trying to keep my husband and raise right. my daughter. <laughs> right. Exactly. But I had exactly. I had a, a, a way more privileged vantage point because I was standing three feet away from those performances. Mm-hmm. Wow. I I could see, smell, touch the acting. Then I would um would get a cassette and could watch dailies. So I would do that. I could watch okay. the show okay. through the monitor at Video Village. And then on the nights that the show aired to the public, we would set up a second TV on stage and all of us, the actors and anyone that was not working could come over and watch the show as it aired um, oh, wow. okay. to the public. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, I, can, I find it, I, I'm watching Picard, the, ser- okay. the Picard series. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I find it difficult to, go back and watch any of TNG because I get so nostalgic. Mm. Oh, I get yeah. very nostalgic. Uh, Cause that's a, that's an era that will never, ever, ever come again for me or them or mm. any of us, the making of that series. Yeah. And I, it really feels like the card is the genuine successor to the next generation. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to season three of, uh, Picard. Oh, me too. So we, me too. Me too. Me too. Yeah. yeah. The trailer <laughs> yeah. was of, off the hook the other day. I That's, loved it. I can't love wait. That trailer. Yeah. Or teaser. I think it was more of a teaser. Than yeah, a teaser. It was really good. Okay, did you so, see okay, it, Miss Adele? Was... <laughs> Auntie Adele, did you see I it? I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> did you like it? I am so excited and happy to be able to see. Um, because, you know, I've not really seen any of the cast. I've had a note from uh, Patrick, but 
I have not seen any of them. And this is all like 35, 30 years later, 35 years later. We 35, all know. yeah. We all <laughs> age. And um, so it's interesting to see how we have all grown up and grown older and who we are now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited about, about the next season. Awesome. Well, okay, I'm still going to go back even to back to Star Trek Next Generation. Oh, and good. You were, you, were in a, you were in a training program, so you, you understood exactly how hard that can be. And I know that they have, they have the directors in training program on Star Trek. And a lot of those people that you just named went through that program and became directors. So I just wanted to know how how did that work? Like one minute, you know, you're you're telling them what to do because they're cast, and then the next minute now they're coming in and they are the director. So did you have any favorites or well, how did it's that, a, how did it's that go? a very close relationship. It's much more it's much closer a relationship than A D and actor. Yes. A D and director you're really um you're bound you're 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 bound at the hip okay your job it well okay the, the assistant director is like in the military mm -hmm. the um captain will have an executive officer mm -hmm. if the captain wants to turn the ship around he doesn't go around and tell everybody okay well, i want to turn the ship around right he tells his executive officer we're going to turn the ship around now and it's number one. It's number one. I am the director's number one. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly what Jonathan Frakes, or what, rather Riker, is to Picard. That's mm -hmm. what I am to uh, the directors. To pave the way for them, to problem solve, to make sure nothing slows them down or gets in their way. And to go to the crew and say, okay, everybody, you got to row faster because the captain wants to water ski. So... <laughs> That, that really is the relationship. Um, and um, during the week, we, we spend a week up in the offices or seven days prepping a script, breaking it down. I'm breaking, I'm the one that breaks it down. You're uh -huh. the one breaking it down. We are not breaking it down. <laughs> yeah, because I'm reading this job description. <laughs> they don't say we. Right. So just, just to, um, I mean. And I, scheduling I've the show. Mm -hmm. Can we just but, tell them a little bit about what that means when you say you're going to break down the script? That means that's You have to break stuff. it down for time. You have to break it down for scenes. Scripts are broken down in one-eighth pages. So mm. eight-eighths makes a page. Mm. And there's a, a timing uh, connected to that. And just how much work you can get done before lunch, how much work you can get done after lunch. What are the man hours? This is going to be a 12 hour day, but this is going to be a 14 hour day. And when we get to Friday, it's going to be a 16 hour day, mm. wow. which is fine as long as that's exactly what it is. Mm. You don't want to schedule a 14 hour day and then come in at a 12 hour day. Oh, you think that would be good, right? But no, right. everybody has budgeted to pay their departments based on a 14 hour day. Uh, the studio wants to know, well, what happened? Did you miss schedule? I thought it was going to be a 14 hour day. Why did you end at 11 and a half hours? They oh see that God. as work hours lost. So mm -hmm. if you schedule a 12 hour day, you make sure it's a 12 hour day mm -hmm. or a 14 hour day or a 16 hour day or a 24 hour day like we did on Beverly Hills Cop 2. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah, we shot all night. We we shot wow. well into the morning. Jeez, it's a lot. And I've heard these kind of horror stories. With I mean, and, and there's nothing you can do. I mean, you've got to get it done, right? I mean, you've got everybody you've there. You got to get it done. You're at the location. That's the wow. other thing. You're picking location. You're That's doing right. shot schedules. You're doing you, you. If there's a horse in there, you got to go get the horse. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's right. Because you do all the talent, right? Even the, right. the kids and the animals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But wow. it's not the nightmare you would think because you still got to look around you and knock on wood and go, where am I? Mm -hmm. I'm standing next mm -hmm. to this big old Panaflex camera on mm -hmm. stage eight 
right. at Paramount Studio, <laughs> right. and they are paying me. Right. <laughs> so it, it's 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 not as bad as it's <laughs> right. <laughs> So, I, go ahead. I I kind of want to go back to TNG a little bit. Sabrina, where were you going? No, uh, no, I was just gonna go ahead. Go stay with but, TNG. Okay, because the thing with black folks in TNG is code of honor. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and I'm wondering, you know, if there's anything that you can tell us about, like behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> You know that about this particular episode and how it actually made it on the air. Yes, you know? there were people that wanted to shoot themselves in the head after that. <laughs> <laughs> so aired. They suddenly oh realized what a big mistake that was, and it was uh, it was addressed openly and talked about, and ooh, we messed up, and you know, um, Gene Roddenberry was still um, at the helm. And with all good intentions, they just, I think, didn't know how to execute that. Mm. They had good intentions, but they didn't know how to execute them. Um, That's all I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) It says a lot. Thank you for telling us that. It's not your imagination. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) It it was perceived as an uh uh-oh. From the beginning or after the or fact? After, after they the, saw it. After they saw after it. After they saw it, after they got reactions from um, home viewers. Oh, okay. Um, oh. Yeah, I think it took a minute for, the, for it to settle in. But um, yeah, they knew pretty much immediately at, after it aired that, um, well, we're not going to do that again. <laughs> I mean, did you did you know what was going on with that? I mean, I, I don't know how you're not seeing it fully done. You're seeing it in, in in portions, but did you know that this was not good? I, you know, I think that I was so happy to see all those black folk on stage. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and in that environment, and that interacting with them. Mm-hmm that my first thought was not, uh uh-oh, why are they still running around in leopard skins? Mm -hmm. Um, My, so I can't really say that until it aired and you could see the thing in entirety that um, it it wasn't uh, executed well. Yeah. Mm Because we were excited when we first started too. I mean, you know, we, oh, we were going to a planet, and they were gonna. It was a black planet. Yeah, right. it's gonna be great. Yeah, right. when the first, the first, the first what, air, and I was like, ooh, look at all these black folks. They got a whole. Yeah. I said, how bad has it gotten on Earth that we all left? Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was like, yes. first, first ten minutes was great. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, yeah, like, you know, and it, it could have been better, but you know, and I think maybe that that had something to do with you know when we went to the other movie, the other episode when we did Dharma, and I was thinking, oh, we got ooh. another black planet, but no, we were, <laughs> we're going to touch that again. Yeah, third well, rail. Not Dharma. One of my favorite uh, uh, episodes. He I love Dharma. Mm-hmm. That is that Paul is Winfield. Mm-hmm. Paul Winfield. Yes. Oh, that is yes. that is one of my yeah. favorites. Yes. Yeah. My favorites. Yes. Yes. We shot those at the caves up in uh, Griffith Park, so it was one of the few shows. You know, every so often we would go out on location. Mostly we stayed on stage eight and nine and sixteen. Our stage sixteen was the biggest stage, and that's where we usually had alien planet surfaces. So okay. we called stage sixteen Planet Hell. <laughs> because that's when we would have the big deserts or the big frozen land or the big forest and you know caves. Those the, yeah exactly on the cave exactly <laughs> yeah yeah ah okay so that one so you're sitting there you get the script and you're like oh we're going outside yeah yeah but i'll tell you one thing um I'm sure that you saw the uh, the second Cosmos series with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
And, you know, there is a, uh, I'm a little more of a science fact fan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a theory that's being worked on right now of parthenogenesis, which is uh, females reproducing without an XY or male chromosome without a sperm. Hmm. Because what science is finding out is that there are many, many, many animals in nature that don't reproduce with a male. They mm -hmm. are just a single gender uh, reproduction. And um, in fact, the Japanese have just completed a um, experiment where they have mated two female mice in order to produce offspring. Because the theory is that that XY, that Y with that little tail hanging off of it, <laughs> is, is actually a mutation. And uh -oh. They uh, they feel that within a certain period of time, the XY chromosome will no longer exist. There will only be X chromosomes, which are female. Hmm. It may not happen for a million years. Uh, uh -oh. Smithsonian Magazine has a really good article that's titled, um, Sorry, guys, but your Y chromosome may be doomed. <laughs> um, we gotta talk oh to my goodness. Nor about this. Uh, <laughs> the reason i mention it is if you if you look at that second cosmos series with neil degrasse tyson the fine he's talking in the final episode the final scene about how the fact that we are going to have to immigrate off of this planet Mm -hmm. We are not going to be able to stay on this planet forever and 500, 1,000 years, whenever it is, we are going to have to move eventually. Yeah. And the final shot of Cosmos is an animation of a first ship taking off from Earth to immigrate to the stars. And at the helm, the only person you see is a woman of color. Mm. And I thought that was just really significant to mm -hmm. to demonstrate that yeah we survive into the future we are the survivors <laughs> we yeah. are the future we're, we're the not originators the, and the survivors that's right that's right Hmm. Right. Wow. You know what wow. that just made me think of uh, immediately was Earthseed, Octavia Butler, uh -huh. and, you know, Parable of the Sower, you know, our destiny uh, is to take root among the stars, that's right. you know, we are Earthseed, and that's, it's really, that's truly powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So we, 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 we can forgive Code of Honor. <laughs> we know we had to ask <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah well I have another question I'm just going to go guiding on you for a minute and say uh -huh. tell me about Jerry Taylor <laughs> How was it working with Jerry? Oh, I thought Another... you were gonna. I thought you were gonna go straight to Guinan. You <laughs> said you're gonna. You're gonna no, pull no. Guinan. I wanted you're to ask about Guinan. Jerry Taylor because this yeah. is another yeah. woman that was behind the scenes that we mm -hmm. had her actually listed as one of the top ten women of Star Trek because we really admired what she did there along with DC Fontana. And I really wanted to talk to you about another woman that was behind the scenes that had a lot to do with Next Generation. So that's why I'm asking about Jerry Taylor. Jerry Taylor was one of the most honest and down to earth uh, executives of either gender that I've ever worked with. She was candid. She would, did not bite her tongue. She had things to say um, that were relevant to um, women in this industry. So I didn't work directly with her because she was the head writer. She mm -hmm. was always up in the writer's office. I okay. was down on the stage. But occasionally I would have to have meetings in her office over something or other or a social, you know, something or other in her office, a birthday cake or something like that. And so she was a, just a really, she was an older woman. 
she was not uh, what you would expect to be a young, hip, you know, executive, hotshot executive. She was an older woman. She was mature. She was sophisticated. Um, and she was just an absolute pleasure. And she brought a lot of balance to the um, show when she came, when she joined. She wasn't there in the first couple of seasons. So um, we were really happy to have her know that she was there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, all right, we're going to go with Guinan. So what was it like working with Whoopi? Because I know she was such a Star Trek fan and wanted to be on that show. Man. <laughs> Whoopi was so much fun. Uh, um, one at one point during the uh, I forget what season it was, but some bright star up in the producer <laughs> office decided, well, we need to cut. We need to make cuts. We got to look at the budget and cut the budget. Um, so the reason what they decided to do was to cut all the candy from the craft service table. That was their big problem. <laughs> <laughs> how much, how much now, candy could they have been? A crew how that how is, much candy y'all eat? Oh, a lot. <laughs> a lot. Because when you're working those late hours, you can't mm -hmm. drink. Right. You need the sugar. <laughs> you need the sugar. So there were always boxes and boxes of candy bars. And someone decided, oh, that's not healthy. We shouldn't do that. <laughs> well, they removed all the candy from the craft service table and Whoopi came to work and immediately picked up her phone and ordered two 25 pound boxes of candy from C <laughs> and had them put on the craft service table. So that's who uh, Whoopi was. Whoopi was fearless. Oh, she so knew that mm -hmm. she was, she had the power on that mm -hmm. show. She was mm -hmm. a big get. She was mm -hmm. big. She was, yeah. And those producers, I'm not saying they were scared of her, but they <laughs> really respected her. But we know they were. And we <laughs> <had to laughs> behind any of us who made Whoopi unhappy. Now, they didn't have to worry about me making her unhappy. But you know, she, yeah, she was the big get, and uh, and they knew it. They knew it. They knew how lucky she was. So yeah, she was just as funny and nice. She would have, you know, whenever there was a, uh, the cast were getting married or having a Christmas party or something, they always invited me and my family, my husband and my daughter. And um, it was just, it was really a very special time for me. I remember one time at Whoopi's house, she was giving a party at her house out in Malibu. And I walked into her room that where she had her pool table and there was my nine-year-old daughter shooting pool with Isai Morales. <laughs> she had no idea who he was. She just thought, oh, he's this is King guy that wants to play pool with me. Um, Aww, and and so it was just those <laughs> memorable moments that my daughter and I both remember of um of our walk on the on the Hollywood side. Mm -hmm. So you've Very given her special. You've given her the same kind of memories that your grandparents gave to you. With the that's Apollo. true. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. That's beautiful. And you know, before I know we're um, drawing close to time on here, but I really did was interested, uh, am interested in trying to understand why so many of us who are black women who are fans of star trek in particular are l just learning of you i mean i some people have known of you for a long time right but it feels like you're starting to get more recognition now and very well deserved recognition now um than you have in the past and um you know so i wonder where are you are you consciously the type of person who sort of, sort of likes to fly under the radar a little bit or, Fair you enough. know, uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, I do because the actors are the stars of the show. The directors are the stars of the show, literally in, in the case of TNG, when LeVar and Patrick and Jonathan started directing. So, you know, you never want to make anyone feel like you're in competition for their thunder. Everybody, you know, has their niche. 
I was just another working minion on the set, making the wheels turn. Um, that was my job. And mm. the fact that I was there for 12 seasons was my reward. Most, wow. most assistant directors are looking for a new job every three to six months. Mm. Wow. I've wow. never had to look for a job. Right. Oh. When, not only okay. did, did Star Trek keep me working, but Paramount, when hiatus time would come, if I wanted to work, they would put me on a pilot somewhere. They would assign me. I never once had to look for work, which is, you know, was such a blessing because for me, with a family, it was like getting up and going to work at a bank. You mm. get up, you get dressed, mm-hmm. you go to work, you're there at 630. If you're lucky you get home by eight. And it, it was just what I needed in order to um, to raise my 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 daughter and uh, keep my family happy. Right. Yeah, I I, I get that. I understand <laughs> that. But I think I think for us, um, the value of getting to know what you do and who you are and how you did it is um, the fact that, like you know. It, so often black women, we're the ones who keep everything running. <laughs> you know, <Yes. laughs> we keep it running in the background all the time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you did it with grace and um, so much power. And I think it's just a really good example for those of us who are going forward, who are trying. Sometimes we get frustrated and sometimes, you know, just just keep going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have to. And I, and I think it's really important too that um, young black women and uh, whatever you know, and men know that these types of jobs are available. I think mm-hmm. a lot of people like I, I'm uh, currently in film school and been in and out in, in the produ- production track and in the screenwriter track. But um, these kind of jobs were not things that I even knew existed. So it's really great, let alone that we had, we were holding some of them um, available and doing it beautifully. Mm -hmm. So I think knowing that there is such a thing as the Directors Guild Producers Training Program, that Mm -hmm. there are all these uh, different sorts of crafts that you can do. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of things that we see on Star Trek, you know, people are interested in makeup and they're interested in um, how things are props and, you know, all these other things that maybe you never would have thought of if not for the fact that you love Star Trek and you saw how it was being made. So I think it's really important that your story gets out there and that people know what an AD is, that you are the person that, you know, runs all those departments, make sure the shooting schedule, you're hiring cast people, you're making sure, you know, you're giving reports up to production that everything's on time. Mm -hmm. You're doing all of this stuff that if, if not for you, (laughs) that show is not going to make it on the air. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, Paramount does not suffer fools easily or at all. And Uh so back to what I said in the beginning, what what Oprah has taught us is that we really do have to uh, work twice as hard, which (laughs) fortunately for me, that's my nature. Uh I, I, I just have that anal type personality where I'm just not satisfied till everything has been, you know, squared away. Um, and so, but it is important what you just said about letting people know, especially people of color, that, you know, there's more to Hollywood than just movie star, director, producer, writer. Exactly. Exactly. There are all of these other careers. They all pay six figures. The guy mm-hmm. that empties the trash makes six figures because everyone in the film industry is overpaid. Mm-hmm. and yeah. those <laughs> jobs are available to you you script supervisor script editor prop master special effects all of those people are movie makers are filmmakers and we just got to let people know that those jobs exist for you too mm-hmm. yeah. i've always been a credit reader always mm-hmm. even when i went to the movies years ago i always stayed for the credit years ago like I used to you used to read album covers, mm-hmm. who did this and who did what I always read and, and said, and I always wondered what, but what is a ADA? What is a, you know, I, oh, what does a producer do? What does a line producer do? Because there's a difference between the two and everything. Right. But I've always, always been interested in the background 
and reading and researching and seeing what these people do because if they didn't do it, if they didn't do it, they wouldn't be in the credits, you know? Right. So the credits are a vast amount of information. Yes. Got, and nowadays, you know, you can go and look up, but that's an ADA, that's an ADR, that's this and that. And you can go and actually Google and pick, oh, they do this, they do that, let me see. So that's another thing I want to throw out there. Read the credits read the lines, read all the stuff, and then Google it. And you got you some information there too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I made exactly that point last month. Um, we were in Montgomery, Alabama at the Urban Nerd Convention. Yay! Yay. <laughs> what I said to them, you know, read those credits. Look at those jobs. Don't think you're mm -hmm. going to Hollywood and become a movie star. Go to Hollywood and become a stand-in and, mm -hmm. and make six figures and stand at the heart of Hollywood and meet the movie stars and be right in the thick of it, be a part of that production. You don't have to be the star. <laughs> you don't. Right, I'm, I'm no. packing my bag. <laughs> <laughs> Sabrina, wait for me. Wait, I wait know, for right? me. I'm coming to putting in my retirement papers. Hey, move to Atlanta. Move to Atlanta and do it there. We can stay on the East Coast. Right. You sure could. could. You're right there in New York, Yvette. There's a lot of stuff going on in New York. We're going to have to check this out. Yeah, we, we really do. I've got a fire now. I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Auntie Adele said. <laughs> I just need to look I, further. I, I have a friend who retired from the railroad. He's up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And now he does extra work. He does oh, extra wow. work, work. And he was actually in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Oh, wow. there. Yes, but he that's all he does now is like extra work. That's and he's cool. making a living at that. Yeah. So, that is very yeah. cool. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah, good working extra will work every day and make a mm -hmm. good living and make friends. And um, it, it's a wonderful way of life because you're inside those gates, you're inside that stage mm -hmm. where, um, where so few people get to go. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are inroads, there are ways in. <laughs> well, well, we go ahead, Sabrina. Wait, no, no, go ahead. I, I was just going to wrap it up because I was going to say we appreciate it. I thought that was a beautiful point to say we appreciate you showing us and sharing your story um, with us. And, uh, you know, hopefully people will be listening and, and think that they can, you know, they can get out there inside those gates too and, and why it's worth being inside those gates. I think the more of us that are inside those gates, the better off um, all the, all the uh, storytelling becomes. Yeah. yeah. Just to add one thought to that is I think a lot of people think, Oh, those people in Hollywood and they're making movies and they're smarter than me and they're prettier than me and they're better than me. And I could never do that. And, oh, they're so special. They're not. <laughs> they are everyday working class people. They are no smarter than you. They are no, well, maybe the actors are prettier. Than you. <laughs> but that's about it. You know, you have probably the average person has whatever it takes to to choose a profession pursue that profession within the industry and make it the only people that don't make it are the ones that give up mm. wow mm -hmm. and there are rich character actors too who don't who are not hollywood beautiful exactly mm -hmm. exactly all right that's it Yvette, we're packing we're going <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, thank Auntie you. Adele from your sci fi sister nieces. We love you so much. We really appreciate you. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. It was our hidden figure. Our hidden figure on TNG. <laughs> we love you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, folks, if you uh, have thoughts on this conversation that we just had with Auntie Adele, and you want to let us know uh, any of those thoughts, Miss Yvette, can you let people know how to get in touch? I sure can. You can find us at sci-fi sisters.com. That's S Y F Y S I S T A S.com. Join us on the mothership. That's M U T H A 
S-H-I-P, and the Sci-Fi Sisters Book Club, both on Facebook. Download the Trek Geeks Network app, where you can find us and our family of podcasts on the Trek Geeks Network. On Instagram, sci-fi.sisters. And we're also on the Twitter, at Sci-Fi Sisters. Become a patron of Sci-Fi Sisters today at patreon.com forward slash Sci-Fi Sisters. After listening to this podcast, please rate us and write a review. We may just read it on an upcoming episode. And we, as always, want to give a shout out to the baddest engineer in all the universes. That's Dose the Anonymous One. It's Dose underscore the Anonymous underscore one on Instagram. Uh, I'm not spelling tonight. Y'all can figure it out. Uh, We've had enough spelling for one show. And uh, Dose, we love you very much. And thank you. Um, He's responsible for our engineering and all the music you hear on our show. And that is it from us, from the the East Coast, uh, Tinseltown, and everywhere in between. We love you all. Peace, love, and hair grease. I would like to give this month's shorty shout outs to the following patrons. Anna Post. Susan V. Gruner, Mohammed Moore, Anne Marie, Luce R., Sue K., Karen Dromera, Dafid Bolston, Eve England, Dave Gregory, Homer Frizzell, Timothy Baum, Ernesto Consagna, Leah Marcus, Howard Hogan, Ann Bradley, Scott Jensen, Jamal Taylor, Darlena Blander, Stephanie Dole, Marjorie Munez, Stephanie Baker, Sam Droke Dickinson, Kalia Zawicki, Kelly McKinnon, TJ Jackson Bay, Felicia Kimball, and Olga Kravchek. Thank you so much for all your support.